have decided that I wanted to talk about this passage sentence by sentence. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to read a sentence and then talk about it. And we're going to work our way through this passage that way. And so our passage is Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to be reading the first 14 verses or seven sentences. And it is up on the screens, I believe, so that we can follow along. Now, Paul's letters get pretty dense. And Paul's sentences get pretty long, okay? I don't know if you've ever noticed that before. I would hate to have to be back in school and have to actually diagram some of Paul's sentences. But, you know, we're going to take them one by one and we're going to talk about them a little bit. So Colossians, beginning at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. And so that is the introduction to the letter. And Paul does the same thing he does in other letters that he writes to other churches in that he first and foremost establishes his credentials. So he says, this letter is from Paul, who is an apostle of Jesus Christ. And here he adds, by the will of God. Now, it is especially important that Paul establishes his credentials in this situation because Paul has never visited, never been to the church that was established at Colossae. And so he is writing to people here that he has never met, never interacted with, okay? And so Paul, in writing them this letter, needs to establish who he is. There is also mention of Timothy, okay? And so Paul and Timothy are together. Paul is thought to be imprisoned in Rome right now. This would be his first imprisonment, which wasn't... Uh, dungeons and chains kind of prison. It was more of a house arrest where he was free to take guests and visitors and, and um, you know, free to interact with people. And so Timothy probably wasn't imprisoned with him. Timothy was probably just visiting at this time. And Timothy is also a notable evangelist, church planter, leader of the Christian movement that's taking place in the first century. And so this is a letter from Paul and Timothy to the church at Colossae. Now, in order to understand Colossae, you have to understand something about the Roman Empire as a whole. And I know I've talked about the Roman Empire a little bit. Uh, the Roman Empire was vast. It stretched from the British Isles all the way to India. So it was many, many miles wide. It was many, many square miles in volume. You had different nations and peoples and nationalities and ethnicities and beliefs and practices all under the umbrella of the Roman Empire. It was also a very persevering empire. You know, I've heard it compared to the United States. You know, we sit in our seats today and we can't even imagine a world that in which uh, the United States is not a superpower. But the United States is only about 230 years old, okay? The Roman Empire lasted and influenced the known world then and ever afterward for 1,500 years, and there are three things that I need to mention about the Roman Empire that are going to help us understand what's happening at this church in Colossae. The first thing I want you to understand is something about Roman law. Now, Roman law is uh, unique in that it only deals with actions. It doesn't deal at all with intent. And so, for instance, in the Roman Empire, there would be no such thing as a hate crime. It, has, it, doesn't, it doesn't concern itself with intent. It's only about action. 
And it only kind of legislated and tried to control the action that would be harmful to the society within the empire. And so there was a lot of flexibility with regard to the law, and that's very understandable. Because when you think about this empire that casts such a vast umbrella of different peoples and nations and tribes and all the different beliefs and practices that came under that umbrella, you know, making specific laws was going to be an exercise in futility anyway. And so there was a great deal of flexibility within the Roman Empire in terms of just the the volume of laws that there were. There weren't all that many. Now, that leads to the second thing I want to say about the Roman Empire, and that is what is referred to historically as the Pax Romana. How many of you heard of the Pax Romana? That is literally translated the Roman peace. And that was the peace that the Roman Empire tried to infuse in itself between all of these different nationalities and ethnicities. It was, it was kind of the spirit that they tried to infuse into their empire to, to keep the peace and to keep things going smoothly. And so Roman law and this idea of Pax Romana went hand in hand. They wanted people to intermingle freely without a lot of contention and especially without uh, the potential for revolts. The third thing I want to mention and it's a pretty basic thing, something we take for granted every day, but Roman roads. The Roman Empire was an amazing road builder. Thousands upon thousands of miles of roads throughout the empire. Some of these roads are still being used today, as well as some of the bridges that they built being used today, thousands of years later. But see, the, the road, the, the, the system of roads throughout the empire actually shrank the world. Shrank the world. It, it allowed for travel. It allowed for people to um, move to different places, to travel to different places. It facilitated the spread of ideas across cultures and across religions and across nationalities and across places. It did much the same for them, those that lived during the Roman Empire, that the uh, technology of the internet has done for us. It has shrunk the world, hasn't it? We have fingertip access to all different kinds of ideas and philosophies and religious beliefs and spirituality hacks and all sorts of things that people are trying to peddle, that people are communicating, that People are trying to use to, to persuade us to a, a different way of life. And so this was all coming to bear on this church in Colossa. Because understand too, Colossa was a long way away from Jerusalem. And there were Jews there, but, but you know, that far away from the center of Judaism, which is the, the religion that Christianity birthed from, uh, a long way from Jerusalem meant that, that this was a church that, that was probably a lot more susceptible to other practices and beliefs and much less accountable to HQ in Jerusalem. And so that created a unique set of problems for this church. Before we move on, I'll just say that Colossae was a pluralistic, multi-ethnic city of great diversity, especially when it came to ideas, beliefs, and philosophies. Picking it back up at verse 3, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. Okay, so section two. After Paul introduces himself, he speaks words of encouragement to this church. Now, he's never been there, but he has heard about it, and he begins by speaking words of encouragement. That means that this is a church that has 
a lot of good things going for it. Now, in a few minutes, we're going to talk about the potential problems that this church is facing, the potential uh, heresies that it's fighting. But Paul's words of encouragement at the beginning of this letter tell me that this was, as of the time of writing, a very strong church. Now, there were things that were rising up and threatening the church, and that's what Paul is going to warn them about. But as of this moment, it is a strong church. A lot of good things going forward. God is doing amazing things in this church. Two, in, we, in, in the passage that we just read, we see, did you catch that familiar triad? Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Now, Paul switches the order a little bit of that familiar triad. He begins with uh, faith, and he ties that to Jesus Christ. So uh, he holds up faith in Christ, and he holds up love for each other. And that is what Paul is saying characterizes the church at Colossae. These are a couple of the wonderful things that Colossae has going for it. Very similar to the things that we have going for us in our church. Faith in Christ, love for each other, from which springs their hope. But I want you to notice, I want you to notice that it's not like Paul is patting them on the back for this. It's not like Paul is thanking them for being such great people. All of the language that we see in these first 14 verses are God-active language. Not the people at Colossae doing the right things, well done, good and faithful servant, you're doing a great job. No, we thank God that these things are the reality in your church that these things are happening in your church. <clears throat> this is not based on their effort. This is based on the gospel at work in their lives. Now, I do this once in a while because we throw around that word gospel an awful lot. We know what the gospel is, right? Very core of the gospel is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? There's a lot of stuff in the Bible. I mean, there's a lot of good wisdom. There's a lot of good truth. But when we are talking about the gospel, the very center of that is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we bump it out from there. Okay? Jesus is the key figure. Without Jesus, we got nothing to live for. Okay? We... If you want to bump it out a little bit, we uh, human beings, we, we turned away from God. We alienated ourselves. We said, you know what, God, um, what you gave us is great, but we want to go do our own thing. And we got ourselves in that rebellion into a pit that we can't get out of ourselves. Having rebelled against God, we have nothing that we can do to make amends. We have nothing that we can do to earn back God's graces. We have no way to get out of that situation. That is why Jesus had to come. Live a perfect life as our representative and then die the death that all of us, you and I, everybody throughout history deserved. And then he conquered death by raising from the dead the first fruits of those who will live for eternity in God's presence. And now those who believe in Jesus Christ, who hold up that work that he did as the primary thing, are those who share in that reward. That's the gospel. So, moving on. All over the world... This gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. And so Paul goes further in this next sentence, talking about the gospel. And this is exciting stuff. It's exciting stuff for the pastor. 
It's exciting stuff for people who are believers. First of all, that the gospel from beginning to end and through and through is an act of God's grace. Don't ever forget that. Again, we have this God active language. It's not that the people of Colossae, it's not that we do anything that's, that's so wonderful. The gospel is about what God has done. But we get a little hint here, too, of the gospel's power in the world at that time. The influence that it had, bearing fruit and growing. It reminded me of that, that verse in Acts 19, where it says, when Paul is in Ephesus, Everyone in Asia, Jews and Greeks alike, had heard the gospel. Everybody had heard it. This thing is spreading like wildfire. You can't stop it. And it's not based on fantastic pastors. And it's not based on us, you know, always making the perfect testimonial presentation. No, no, no. The gospel has a power all its own, infused by God, initiated by God, consummated by God, and people are being changed by it. And it is a cultural influencer. My prayer every day is that it continues to be that in our world. Well, Paul moves on, verse 7. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Now, you remember I mentioned that Paul had never been to Colossae, never met the people there at Colossae. So how did a church get planted in Colossae? Well, here we have our answer. Epaphras is a guy who is thought to have planted the church in Colossae. And he is also credited with planting two other churches in the neighboring cities of Laodicea and, um, why am I blanking here, Hierapolis. Laodicea and Hierapolis who um, kind of uh, flank Colossae. And so Epaphras is this guy that had planted Colossae in addition to two other churches, and he probably heard the gospel while Paul is in Ephesus, serving three years there as Ephesus' pastor. And I want you to notice what Paul does here. Not only does Paul establish his own credentials, he also lifts up Epaphras, who is the church leader at Colossae, and says, hey, this is a guy who knows his stuff. This is a guy who understands the gospel. He is being true to the gospel. This is someone to listen to. And I love that about Paul. Paul is always about the other guy. He's always about lifting up the other guy because in Christ, who needs to be the top dog, right? In Christ... He's just happy that Christ is being preached. And so he's able to lift up Epaphras and say, hey, I'm going to tell you some things, but listen to this guy. He knows what he's talking about. <clears throat> Verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And so what struck me here, and it's not a deep theological point, but what struck me here is what kind of community is this where Paul can write to people that he's never met and say, you know what, I, I love you like brothers and sisters, and I pray for you constantly pray that God is doing amazing things in and with you. I pray that you are staying true to the gospel. This is a beautiful thing. What other context in the world do you have a statement like this that actually makes sense? What kind of a community can be built in absentia? How is it that we can can pray for the missionaries that we support. And we're, 
We're praying for people in, in Thailand and in Central America and in Africa, people that we've never met, people that we will never meet, people that we can't even put faces to their identity, and yet we pray passionately that God will be working in their lives and that they will hold strong to the gospel and that, that someday, once everything is consummated, we will be together in heaven with people that we've never met. And we're excited about that. I, I, I just wanted to point that out. I love how Paul talks here. But here too, and this is perhaps more apt to moving forward, we have our first mention of knowledge in the book of Colossians. And knowledge is going to be a, a theme that comes back again and again. A knowledge in the Greek language is uh, gnosis, okay? Gnosis, that starts with a silent G, in case you're looking that up on your phone. Um, gnosis. And this gnosis, this knowledge, seems to be something that is very greatly desired by the people at this church in Colossae. Not only is it greatly desired, but as we will see throughout Paul's letter and throughout his argument, it is also very deeply misunderstood by some people in this church verse 10 and we may pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the lord and may please him in every way bearing fruit in every good work growing in the knowledge of god being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. One sentence, folks. That was one sentence. Unbelievable. But it is in that sentence that we get our first glimpses of the heresies, of the false teaching that Paul is going to be addressing throughout the rest of his letter. What is this threat to the gospel in the church at Colossa? Well, it's hard to say because Paul never really spells it out. He just speaks against it. But, Based on what we learn in this letter, what Colossae was faced with was a hodgepodge of competing ideas about spirituality or spiritual maturity. Now, it seems to have some elements of Judaism because it talks about dietary laws, it talks about some of the ceremonial stuff from the Old Testament. It talks about circumcision. It also seems to have some uh, components of mysticism. Colossae talks, or Colossians talks about uh, the worship of angels, the allegiance to different powers and principalities that are lesser than God, but that have some control over daily life. Now, that kind of mysticism sounds an awful lot like idolatry to me, which makes it a little bit puzzling why Paul refers to this as angel worship, because, you know, any power and principality that distracts us away from the supremacy of Christ, it seems like that would be demonic activity, but perhaps those words are interchangeable because in Paul's theology, demons were fallen angels, and that's how we understand it. But you have Judaism mixed with this strange idolatrous mysticism, and then the last component you have in this belief system is what's called Gnosticism. Now, I looked for a good definition of Gnosticism because it's one of those things that you learn about and you kind of know in general, but, you know, it's hard to find a really concise definition for Gnosticism. But at its very 
base, as we said, gnosis, Gnosticism, means knowledge. It's the belief that, that when it comes to spirituality, there are certain hacks that are available to bump you up the ladder. There is secret knowledge out there that can give you a leg up in terms of <coughs> your spiritual maturity. Now you notice I'm talking a lot about spiritual maturity because Gnosticism has this, this aspect or, or this overlay of, of dualism, which is you know this belief that, that everything that's spiritual is a good thing and something to be pursued, and everything that's material, like our bodies, is something that's really less important. As a matter of fact, it's even, you know, kind of something to be ashamed of, something to, to detach from. That's the goal. And so the, the goal of Gnosticism in a spiritual sense is to, to move from, from a place of darkness to a place of light. And that's why in Colossians you see a, a lot of this interplay between darkness and light as well. What is true darkness and what is true light that we should be pursuing? Um, so, so you have this aspect of dualism too. And now um, just coming into how this is practiced or lived out, you know, dualism kind of manifests itself in, in one of two ways. Now the first way that a dualism would manifest itself in someone's life is, is by way of asceticism. Now, if you think that the spiritual is good and the body is less important or bad, asceticism would err more toward, you know what, anything that's material is probably something to be avoided as much as possible. And so an ascetic would look at something like sex and say, you know what, sex is maybe necessary for procreation, but, you know, anything that has to do with physical pleasure is something that we're suspicious of. It ties us to our dirty, mortal bodies, and it's not good for us spiritually. And so ascetics would, would be the ones that have, like, dietary laws. You don't want to take any pleasure in the food that you eat. Or, you know, different uh, sexual laws or, uh, you know, even celibacy, saying, you know what, any kind of, any kind of physical contact that, that creates pleasure in me is something to be avoided. And so asceticism is, is the one way that dualism would uh, manifest itself. But the other way would be uh, in terms of hedonism. Now, many of you have probably heard the term hedonism. Hedonism is, it comes from the same place in terms of thinking that the spiritual is what's important and the body is less important, but rather than, rather than the, the, the pleasures of the body being evil, um, the pleasures of the body for a hedonist would be, you know, it's not all that important in the long run anyway, so I can just do whatever, else, whatever I want with my body. Okay, so, you know, indulge in whatever sexuality that you want to indulge in and, and eat whatever you want to eat. That would be more of a hedonistic. And there's evidence that, that there's, evidence, there's evidence of both uh, kinds of manifestations of that Gnostic dualism in Colossae as we move forward. And so you see that this kind of mix of things going in Colossae are... You know, not only are they confusing, but, but very, very hard to confront and probably hard to combat as well. But it just goes to show, just to simplify things a little bit, <coughs> you know, you think about some of the other churches and the problems that they deal with in, in terms of the ones that Paul wrote to. You remember the church in Corinth, um, the, the, one of the issues there was, you know, they're, they're receiving these gifts of the Holy Spirit and... And they're not using them properly. Like, as soon as they get gifts of the Holy Spirit, they start thinking, okay, which ones are the most important and which ones uh, are the least important and which ones fall in between. And, and then when it comes to Galatia, which, which had a situation where it's more of a, a straight Orthodox Judaism, Old Testament Judaism trying to be overlaid on Christianity, and it's all about keeping the law in the proper way, keeping the ceremonial law and and whoever keeps the ceremonial law the best and the purest is, is really the spiritual giant in that church. And, and here in Colossa, it's just this, this kind of jumble of different things. 
Whoever figures out the secret knowledge, the secret spiritual knowledge, is the one who has the leg up on everybody else. But you see the similarity in all of these things. It has to do with what we accomplish, what we manage to learn, what we manage to do. Another thing that, that, that is common among all three of those churches is that, you know, whenever, whenever human beings get into a group, what is the first thing we do? We want to establish the pecking order. I want to know how I rate against you and you and you and you. And, and so there's got to be a leader and there's got to be like the least important person. And then everybody's trying to kind of find their place in the, in the pecking order. And so whether it comes to spiritual gifts, whether it comes to secret knowledge, whether it comes to obeying the law, that's, that's really, in essence, what we're trying to do. Like, I want to see who the top guy spiritually is, and I want to see where the bottom guy spiritually is, and then I want to kind of see where I fit in between. But brothers and sisters, that is what we're fighting against here in Colossae. Somebody much smarter than me once said, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. It's even, okay? Anytime we start trying to establish a pecking order when it comes to spirituality, what we're doing is we're robbing Jesus of his supremacy. Not only are we robbing him of his supremacy, we're robbing him of his sufficiency. And that's wrong. That stands against the gospel. And so we better move on. Running out of time. Verse 13. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Obviously we're talking about God here. Paul is talking about God and the Son refers to Jesus Christ. And this isn't a flashy statement, but it's a doctrinally true statement. Talking about what I was just saying about Jesus' sufficiency, about Jesus' supremacy. In other words, you know, the gospel is enough. Everything we could ever want or need has already been won for us by Jesus Christ. And we all have that need. We all have that need. When we come to the cross, we're all on level ground. And so let me close this way today. I hope I gave you a good taste of what we're in for in terms of combating some of these just different ideas, these different life hacks, these different spirituality hacks. Because let's face it, everybody's got an answer that they're trying to peddle in our day and age too. Globally. And we have access to it all. So I think this is going to be a very helpful book and a very helpful study for us. But as I said for today, brothers and sisters, remember this. We are rescued people. We are redeemed people. And we are forgiven people. Brought by God from the kingdom of darkness into the true kingdom of light, which is his kingdom. May we live in the truth of that knowledge, gospel knowledge, in Christ alone, with no additions or subtractions, for the glory of God. Amen. Let's pray.